To talk about his creative journey, I welcome to the Drawing Inspiration Podcast, Ryan Clater. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Hey, Mike. I am great. It's so nice to be here chatting with you after uh, listening to over 100 episodes of yours. So <laughs> thanks for having me here. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I was, uh, I was so happy to discover you. You reached out uh, after I think I had Christina Wald on. That's right. And, yeah. And uh, we exchanged a few emails and you started talking about this Kickstarter project that you're doing. And maybe you can touch on that quickly, and then I'm going to dig into your childhood. So, okay. <laughs> so what is this Kickstarter uh, book that you're working on? Sounds great. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's uh, great to chat with you. And uh, this book that I'm kickstarting right now is called One Bite at a Time. And it's an oversized hardcover art book featuring 20 years of my work in comics, illustration, and design. And I am over the moon excited about this for a couple reasons. One, because of the content, and two, because of the formatting. And I'll try to talk about those briefly here real quick. But the content, uh, not only is it featuring my work from the past couple decades, but there is a heavy emphasis on process. So a lot of behind the scenes images showing how each piece was created, uh, in fact, every single piece in there has a lot of process pages along with it and a little bit of contextual info. Um, the formatting of the book is also pretty unique, I think, uh, because it's going to be a very fancy book. Uh, on the cover, we've got dual cloth bound cover. In fact, I, we're recording video, so maybe I can show you some of this as I speak about it. Um, mm -hmm. So the cover will have a dual cloth bound cover. So this is two different colors of cloth, not just paper wrapping the book. And it will also have a dual foil stamped cover, spine and back cover. And uh, it's also gonna have copper gilded page edges, built-in ribbon bookmarks. And I haven't even got to the interior formatting, <laughs> which uh, also supports this whole theme of process, which runs throughout the book. So inside, we're gonna have things like gatefold pages, die cut reveals, vellum overlays, and more. Uh, so for example, I'm showing on screen, I'll try to narrate this to your podcast listeners, but this is a page of original artwork from one of my books uh, that I co-wrote with my buddy, Nick Baldridge. It's called Coin Op Carnival. And we interviewed Wayne Nyans, the world's most prolific pinball designer. And this is gonna be featured in the book at a really high resolution scan. So uh, now podcast listeners, we're looking at a close up of this scan, which shows the original blue line pencils and then the inks on top of that and some double stroked areas to kind of thicken the contour lines. But when it's printed in the book, it will not just be this original artwork. You'll actually be able to see through the original artwork because there will be a few holes cut in the page. And through that page, you'll be able to see the final finished, cleaned, and colored version. So you can see a before version in the original artwork and an after version with the uh, colored portion but you can also see a before and after at the same time as you're looking through these die cut elements in the page. So this is just one of many formatting specialty things that I'm including in this book that's, uh, again, all supporting this theme of process. That looks incredible. I'm really excited to see this. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I can I can hear it in your voice that this is a passion, <laughs> passion project for you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know if I said this or not, but uh, if people are interested in checking this out, I tried to make a real easy URL for you to go see it. It's onebiteatatimebook.com. That's onebiteatatimebook.com. That's fantastic. And I will include that in the show notes as well. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, we're going to get... Back to that, I think, the Kickstarter, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I, th I thank you for mentioning that because I, I really want to encourage people to support uh, other artists and what they're doing in their endeavors, and I think it's fantastic to lead the show with that. Well, thank and you. I, I, I'm wondering, w with the 10-year-old version of you, what would they think? What would you think at 10 about you doing a book like this? Like, what were you like as a kid and, and 
Man, I don't even know if the 20, 25 years, 30 year old me would understand this kind of project. <laughs> you know, when, when I first started making comics 20 years ago, it was such a wildly different landscape. You know, I was just talking with some folks about it today, how uh, what a tremendous resource Kickstarter is. Uh, when I first started making comics, I was literally hand printing hand folding, hand stapling, and walking my books around to comic book stores, hoping that somebody would take them on consignment in the hopes that maybe one day I'd see a little bit of return for it. Uh, I have students these days, I'm a, I'm a university professor and I teach comics at Michigan State University, and I have students that I coach through Kickstarter campaigns, and they have garnered over $1,000, over $2,500 for their very first comic book. And if you told me that was possible 20 years ago, I would not have believed you. So um, yeah, this is just a wildly different landscape. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, as as a kid, were you? I mean, obviously, we all liked comics. Uh, it stuck with you probably longer. But when you were uh, a kid flipping through the comics, is is that where you wanted to go? Did you thought? Did you think I, I want to make these? I want to tell the stories. Did, were, and then, did you end up starting to do that? Like, how did it start for you as a kid? No. So if if I'm going to answer the traditional Mike Hindley question about my first <laughs> drawing memories, it was not drawing comics. Uh, I was drawing for sure when I was young. And some of my earliest memories are, you know, four or five, six years old as I was drawing my Care Bears. And uh, I had a very supportive uh, pair of parents who... Um, you know, my my mom would hand me a piece of fabric and I would draw something on it and then she would stitch it into a pillow. And we had so many of these pillows that she made from my artwork. And then my dad would hand me like a piece of plywood and let me draw on it. And then he'd cut it out with the, I don't even know what kind of saw you call that, but something that you can cut, you know, fine outlines with. And, uh, and he'd post them on something and we'd hang them on the wall. So that was, uh, I, I had a lot of support growing up in terms of uh, my interest in art. And were you, you know, so obviously you got to, you get to a point later on where you uh, got into comics uh, as a matter of producing them, but were you flipping through comics? What, what was your comic or comic series or comic genre of choice uh, when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, back in the ancient times, they had these things called newspapers, and I remember reading in the comic section, you know, all the all the strips that we've come to know and love, uh, you know, Peanuts, Calvin and Hobbes, and you know whatever else was featured, and um, so that was probably some very early comics reading of mine. But uh, when I was about maybe seven or eight, I was really interested in reading. Uh, Disney comics and found myself gravitating toward uh, the duck books like Donald and Uncle Scrooge. Um, I, I just found the Mickey comics a little uh, boring, <laughs> like things always went Mickey's way. And I, that was hard for me to relate to. Whereas Donald, he'd, you know, sort of get frustrated and have to tackle his problems. And, um, you know, and who doesn't want a bin full of money? So I was reading Uncle Scrooge <laughs> comics, too. Um, uh, and lots of great adventures in there. But as I progressed in age, I started to appreciate satire a little more and started reading uh, work by Sergio Aragones called Gru the Wanderer. Uh, Sergio Aragones is a uh, Spanish-American uh, Spaniard by way of Mexico, by way of America, uh, cartoonist who's been drawing for Mad Magazine for over 50 years. Uh, his creator-owned comic, Grew the Wanderer, has been running for well over 30. I'll have to check when that started. It might be getting close to 40 years at this point. Um, but that was a big influence on me was Grew the Wanderer. Uh, his work was not realistic. It's very cartoony, but it's riddled with detail. And as a reluctant reader growing up, I really rejoiced in all the visual detail that was there and could just pour over those for days. So I, I, I loved reading through Gru comics and picked them up every month for many years. 
That's awesome. I'm not familiar, but uh, I will find a link and put uh, it in because I... I'll, I'll have to send you some copies. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, like when I was growing up, it was um, you know the typical Spider-Man and and uh, Turok, uh, Son of Stone. For some reason, I remember mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I remember I had and and you know so this is quite a while ago, right? But um, I remember I had a, a Spider-Man comic and it had um, like a 45. At mm. the back of it, that, oh, interesting. You, that, that was like um, it was made of, of material. It wasn't like a forty-five, and and uh, I'm talking about it like a record. Yeah, for, for those who may not know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it wasn't. It wasn't a hard record. It was like a sheet of paper, and then you put a penny on it, on the turntable to keep it flat and balanced, and you would play it. And I listened to that. Because so then you flip through the comic book as it tells you the story oh, wow. with the sound effects and the, and the voices and it was uh, Spider Man and, and Draco the Dragon mm -hmm. and uh, there was a point in there where he talks about the sky and I just I remember that story so much because I played it over and over I had this ugly red record player and I would flip through the comic and that story would play and it was fantastic <laughs> it, it was like. It, that was multimedia back then. Totally. Right? This, is, <laughs> this is like 1973, 4, 5, I don't know, somewhere in there. Man, yeah. that, that must have been a perfect era for Spider-Man marketing because uh, this is tangenting a little bit, but at Michigan State University where I teach comics, we have the largest public collection of comic books in the world. And along with comic books, we have some ephemera and one of those pieces is this sounds crazy a, a roll of spider-man toilet paper and it's the most well done toilet paper roll i've ever seen because it's not just a repeat every ply or two but there's an entire story on this roll so you can sit there and read the entire thing it, it doesn't from what i've seen it hasn't repeated and i've i've pulled it out a little ways but you know it's like 40, 50 years old at this point. So it's a little fragile. I'm trying to be right. careful with it. But uh, I mean, just the products you're talking about, like this, um, you know, very thin, almost paper like record, and then this like ephemeral toilet paper <laughs> roll story that you can literally read. It's uh, it fascinates me. <laughs> That's crazy. Imagine having that in your house and. You know, you, you go in and chapter three and four are missing, and it's like, <laughs> who, who ruined my story? Right. Tell me what happened? You got to make sure you're the only one using that bathroom. Exactly. <laughs> bring the roll in with you. Bring it out. Yeah. That's hilarious. So, did you, uh, did you end up going through high school thinking? I'm going to start. So, like, at some point, you work from you go from consumption to creator, and did that happen in high school? That took me a real long time. Uh, I always enjoyed art, but it wasn't until after undergrad that I started really getting serious about the possibility of making comics. Um, I read comics throughout. Um, you know, I'd say. Um, leading up to high school. And then once I got to high school, I kind of forgot about comics for maybe about 10 years or so. And it wasn't until the tail end of undergrad that I had a buddy of mine uh, come to me and say, hey, uh, do you mind giving me a ride? I had a, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a car my last year of college. And he said, can I have a ride to the comic book store in town? I'm like, oh, sure. I used to do that. So I took him there and my mind was just exploded into a million pieces from all the incredible work that had come out in the past 10 years. I ended up picking up a book from, uh, you know, my favorite cartoonist, Sergio Aragones. There was this uh, collection called Boogeyman, and it's about this old guy who... Uh, basically walks around a graveyard and tells stories about these people who were formerly living and how they died. And uh, it was such an interesting book, and that got me back into comics in a big way. I started reading voraciously and having just exited undergrad with a degree in art studio, I started thinking, my gosh, why am I not trying my hand at this? But there, at the time, there wasn't really... Uh, many, if any, 
uh, degree programs in comics. So I was largely teaching myself through uh, any means I could, you know, reading online blogs or getting books on comics and uh, meeting some of my heroes, uh, you know, having lunch with them, you know, taking them out to lunch, asking them a bunch of questions and interning at Marvel Comics eventually uh, before I uh, started releasing my own comics in 2004. Wow, that's incredible. And so where did you go to school? So you went and got a fine art degree, right? But it was with a focus on... Yes. So I did my undergrad at University of California, Santa Barbara, and then my graduate work at San Diego State University. And at SDSU, uh, my emphasis was in multimedia, which was kind of the <laughs> the catch-all media for the outsiders of outsiders like you know we we had the art department which is kind of you know weird and removed but then within the art department you had these more traditional media painting sculpture uh woodworking ceramics etc uh but then multimedia had folks like uh, people who were doing computer art, but also photography and also comics and a number of different things. So it was like if you didn't fit into any of those categories, then you went into multimedia. And that's where all the weirdos of the weirdos got together. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get to your teaching later on. But I wanted to ask you now, like having been through those two programs mm -hmm. as a matter of undergrad and graduate and being a professor now, what does that environment look like in that in those span of years? How has it changed? Oh man, um, I feel like it's so hard to talk about that because it's all such a very personal experience. But when I was an undergrad, uh, I I felt like there was a bit of um, I guess tough love might be the kindest way to say it is you know you're you're young you don't have a lot of life experience yet and there were some professors who tried to work that out of you and <laughs> because in a fine art program you're not just perfecting your mechanical skills you're trying to say something with your art you want your art to have a message or a meaning or a theme and uh, f fresh out of high school I wasn't aware of that, and I learned that uh, over the course of my undergrad career um, in some pleasant ways and in some unpleasant ways. <laughs> um, with that said, I feel like I try to take a far more caring approach to teaching students that. Um, you know, it's not quite as hazy <laughs> as it once was, I feel like that was an experience that I did not enjoy. And I want people in my classes to enjoy what they're doing. And I think we can still learn even if there's a lack of antagonism. So I really try to make my classrooms a safe space, making sure everyone is welcome, making sure we can all talk about our thoughts, our feelings, and do so candidly so that the artist understands what's being received and vice versa. So anyway, I guess that would be my my hope and dream that <laughs> it's a little more um, of a, gosh, I'm really struggling with um, some diplomatic words here, but maybe a, <laughs> a little more humane environment than what I experienced uh, 25 some odd years ago. Yeah, it sounds... Uh... Uh, you know, maybe a difference between a boot camp and uh, a truly collaborative, creative experience. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's that's my hope, anyway. Oh, you have to ask my students if that's if I'm successful in that or not. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll get one of them in the next right. podcast. <laughs> so, you know, you do your undergrad work, you do your graduate work, and you said you ended up um, at Marvel. But I'm curious about like when you decided to start working in the comic industry. What does that look like? Do you have a portfolio that you bring to whomever? Did you go to, like, were there Comic-Cons at that point in time? Because I've heard people go there and start showing their work that way. So how did you kind of get into the industry? Yeah, so um, a common question of beginning cartoonists is, 
how do I break into comics? How do I, how do I break in? Like there's a physical wall or a barrier that you have to get through. And that is a question that always makes me bristle. Uh, that is not the case. There is not a wall. And the only thing separating you from making comics is making comics. And that's it. You can choose to, like, I, I like to think of comics as, like, wading into the ocean. If you want to just try it out, you can dip your toe in it and see if that's for you. Or you can go in up to your waist and maybe, you know, make a couple of comics and you know, one every, you know, several years if you want. Or you can totally submerge yourself and say, okay, I am a cartoonist now and I'm making comics and this is what I do. Um, so there's really not this barrier. You can make comics whatever you want it to be. So I wanted to get that out of the way first because I want people to feel like, hey, you can make comics too. You can try making comics. There is no barrier. In fact, it's one of the most accessible media around. All you need is a piece of paper and pencil and you're ready to go. So um, I think you were asking about how did I make my way into the comics industry. And uh, after undergrad, I, I told you my, I took my buddy to uh, that comic book store and started really getting interested in comics in a big way after undergrad. And uh, after undergrad, I was also teaching some courses at a local community college. And um, I was teaching graphic design courses, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, web tools, uh, programs like Flash and Dreamweaver at the time, if you remember those. Oh, yes. <laughs> and um, I was getting into comics in a big way and applied for this internship because I wanted to learn comics from the best of the best. So I applied to uh, the internships at the big two, uh, Marvel and DC, and uh, Marvel got back to me and they said, we're a little confused. Are you a professor or are you a student? And I was taking classes at that community college at the same time I was teaching. I was taking some figure drawing courses to improve my my figure drawing. And, uh, and I told them, I am whatever you want me to be. And they're like, well, you have to be a student in order to have this internship. And I said, okay, I am and I can prove it. So uh, they said, all right, as long as you send that paperwork, you're in. And so uh, in the summer of, I think it was 2002, uh, there were two interns that summer. It was me and it was Ang Lee's son. And that was the summer that the Ang Lee's Hulk movie just came out. And so it was the two of us floating around in the Marvel offices together and learning so much. I mean, we, I, I, I was learning industry technical standards in the bullpen about how to scan in your artwork and how to process it for print. And uh, I don't know if you or your listeners know this, but there's essentially no in-house talent at either of the big two at any company these days. Uh, so there's no uh, artists or pencilers or inkers or letters or colorists. Everybody is freelance and works outside of the offices. Huh. Except when I was there, they had one person still working there. His name was Dave Sharp. He was a letterer and uh, he was this like big metal looking guy like I had long hair and like he played in a metal band and I was a little intimidating to approach him but you know I was a little gregarious and I went up to him and I said hey Dave uh, can you teach me how to letter comics because like I was there to learn <laughs> and so he's like uh oh, yeah come back in a few days I'll I'll have something for you and so I'd come back every two or three days and hey Dave how you doing and the same thing would repeat come come back and see me in a few days and so Eventually, one week, Dave stuck his head out the door and he's like, hey, Ryan, sort of motioned me in. And I came into his office. I'm like, OK. Uh, he's like, here's an issue of Inhumans. Letter it. I'm like, uh, do you want to give me any direction or anything? He's like, nope, just letter it and we'll talk about it when you're done. So I lettered the entire issue. He brought me over to his desk afterward and took me through page by page, panel by panel, balloon by balloon, and critiqued each and everything that I had done, gave me a ton of tips. Uh, again, this is stuff that I still share with my students today and, of course, using my own work. Um, so it was just 
a summer of comics for me. Not only did I have that internship, but I was also taking some Saturday classes at the Joe Kubert School of Cartooning. Uh, taking classes from Fernando Ruiz, who is an Archie artist. And uh, th- this is a little funny. The Saturday classes, I did not know this when I enrolled. They were for children. And I was there too. <laughs> but he was teaching stuff that I did not know. And so I would stay after class and talk with Fernando because uh, you know we were able to chat on a similar level. And uh, he was at the time selling his pages on eBay, but this was in a a very early state of uh, eBay and also, uh, you know, digital imagery. And so he was telling me how he would go to Kinko's to uh, make copies of his work and reduce it so that it would fit on his scanner. And I said, why don't you just scan it two times and then piece them together? He's like, oh, that sounds very complicated. I could never do that. I'm like, Fernando, I teach this stuff. Can I please show you? And he's like, oh, yes. And then I could show you some more cartooning stuff. And so we had this like symbiotic relationship over that summer where I was teaching him digital art. He was teaching me traditional cartooning methods. And it was just comics, comics, comics that entire summer. And I learned so much. (laughs) That's incredible. Uh, I hope you got a good mark in that course. <laughs> I hope you outdid the kids. <laughs> I, I tried to stay out of the way for the most part during the class. Right. I wanted the kids to get you know what they came there for. But then you know Fernando and I would would have some lunch afterwards and 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 share share knowledge. So yeah, uh, for worked some out. Reason, I'm, I'm thinking of like scenes from the the Christmas movie Elf. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Or like Kramer taking karate class. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, uh, so you you do that the summer of summer of fun, summer of love for comics, <laughs> and uh, uh, what happens after that? What, because you talk about freelancing, right? So that probably ends up becoming a bit of a theme for you as you as you move forward. But what is it, what does it look like as you start moving through the industry and and taking this on as being a career for you? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question because my freelance stuff has really changed over the years. Um, I remember when I was first building up my skills, I would get these jobs that were just so boring, Mike. (laughs) I I did these. uh, There was a San Diego League of Voters that needed to put together this pamphlet to talk about how to use these newfangled electronic voting machines at the time. And they did not want photographs in there. They wanted illustrations, but they didn't want me to illustrate anything. They just wanted me to trace these photographs in ink. So that's all I was doing. Um, I also got an inking job for a restaurant that wanted me to uh, make a coloring book for them. But again, it was kind of a, here's some existing artwork, but we want line art of this artwork. So it was a glorified tracing job. Um, But at the same time, When I came back from Marvel Comics in New York, I was very interested in making my own work. So I was, as a reader, gravitating toward nonfiction comics like uh, historical, historical fiction, autobio. And I started creating my own series of autobiographical comics called And Then One Day. So I was making these comics. And while I was making that first issue, I also... uh, organized an event in my hometown for the very first 24-hour comics day. And this is a challenge put on by a comics practitioner and theoretician named Scott McLeod. And the origin of this was when he would see his buddy at conventions just whipping out these sketches like they were nothing, but he was notoriously late on deadlines. And Scott said to his buddy, you're so fast. I'll bet you could create a comic in a day if you wanted to like 24 pages, six panels of a page. Like that's, you know, unheard of prior to that. And the guy said, Oh no, no, that's not possible. Nobody could do that. And Scott kept thinking about it and tried the first one on his own and he did it. And since that time it's grown into a national international day, this challenge where various comic book stores. And in my case, I was in a very small hometown, Uh, I put it together in a local martial arts studio and set up a bunch of tables and some folks came out. And to my surprise, Scott McLeod himself 
showed up that day, came out, told us all <laughs> how brave we were for doing this. It was really an amazing uh, experience. And so my 24-hour comic and my first autobiographical comic were the two books that came out simultaneously in 2004. So those were my first books. Wow. What do you? So you probably still have them. What do you think of them when you look back at them? <laughs> like most artists, a little cringy when you look back <laughs> at your early work. Uh, but it's also heartening to see that progress has been made. And mm -hmm. I, I try not to think too ill about them because they are where a lot of my readers first got to know me. And I know from reading work of people that I really admire, even their early work, I really love it. And I, I, I would hate for them to disparage that. And so I don't want to disparage my own early work either. Um, but, you know, I, I think I'm, I've come a little way since then. <laughs> did you, did you find that your, um, and I think you hinted at it as well, the books that the comics that you were reading changed over time as well. And what, who were you following? Who was, who was really uh, working for you as a matter of a content creator? Yeah. Um, I really enjoy the work of Sergio Aragones, as I've mentioned, not only when I was young, but it's one of those rare instances where the work holds up over time. This thing that you liked as a child, you can still appreciate today. Um, I also like the work of Andy Watson. He's an artist from the UK. He's produced comics like uh, Love Fights, Slow News Day, Little Star. Um, you know, the list goes on and on, but um, he's a really fantastic artist and storyteller. Uh, I like the work of Emile Ferris. She produced My Favorite Thing is Monsters recently, like probably, I say recently, like maybe five years ago at this point. Um, the Canadian cartoonist Seth is, you know, one of my Mount Rushmore of cartoonists. Uh, he, he, probably the work he's best known for is a, a giant brick of a book called Clyde Fans. Um, and I could go on, but I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Well, that's good because it gives me a chance to plug the fact that I do really good show notes. So nice. Uh, <laughs> so anyone who is listening um, to this or watching, because uh, this will be possibly the first video, if not, <laughs> if not, it'll be a, a second or third. But just to remind people that I, the show notes, especially for the audio podcast, are uh, I think very detailed. And so if you're listening to this, you're going out for a run, bike ride, uh, sitting in a car that uh, whenever you get back to where you need to be or get to where you're going, um, the notes are there for you to follow up and kind of chase these people down, check out the books. Uh, we'll obviously include links to, uh, to, to all of Ryan's stuff at the end but um, and the Kickstarter campaign, which will be critical. But uh, I just wanted to remind people if this is your first time listening. Yeah, really and I'll, show notes. I'll, I'll second that. I have listened to a number of your podcasts, and I'm always impressed by how thorough the show notes are. So I don't understand how long that takes you. It must be a mammoth task every episode. But as a listener, I thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, after doing so many, it's a bit of a routine. But I, I, I've done every single podcast edit and the show notes on my iPad. Wow. And uh, that was something I started from the very beginning. It's like, uh, you know, because I was a big fan of the iPad, I used Procreate a lot. And I was like, I need to be able to do the podcast mm -hmm. on this. I don't record it on the on the iPad, but I use Ferrite and that's what I edit with. Mm -hmm. And then I have, especially now with iOS 17, it's nice to have the, the flexibility in moving the windows around. So mm -hmm. as I'm listening to you, <laughs> as I will be listening to you again uh, in the edit, as I hear things, I put them down in the show notes and then I Google them and find everything out. But I, I've i always been disappointed in listening to some podcasts and it's like, this is great and fantastic. And, oh, that sounds like two or three books I have to get. And then I go look at the podcast and it's like, you can find so-and-so here. And it's like, no, I wanted more. Right. I wanted the thing. I was expecting a shopping list. Right. And instead, you give me a business card. That's not what I wanted. So, um, so yeah. So, you're, you know, you, you put out these first two books. Um, did that kind of guide you in what comes next for you? Uh, yeah, I stayed on the autobiographical series for 
another several issues. I went to about nine issues and several of those were compiled into collected versions. Uh, you know, I would serialize longer stories. And um, so I was autobio cartoonist for quite some time and it wasn't until about 2019 that um, I put out this co-written publication called Coin Op Carnival about electromechanical coin-operated amusement devices, or in layman's terms, old pinball and arcade games. <laughs> and so I co-wrote this with my buddy Nick Baldridge, and I illustrated the entire thing. It's sort of an illustrated magazine. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, multi-column prose with uh, images, uh, illustrations. Uh, but I'd say about 20% of the 64-page issue is full-blown comics. Uh, you know, we have the introduction with Nick and I talking about the impetus for creating this publication. And then the uh, person that we interviewed, Wayne Nyans, had some stories that he told. And one of them was so great, I wanted to feature it in comics form. And so there's a, a, a Wayne Nyans comic in there as well. Fantastic. So do you like pinball machines then? Just, is that what you're trying to say? Just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> do, do you have some? Do you have many? I, I've got some pinball machines, yeah. <laughs> I, I see. It's like an asking an artist, do you carry sketchbooks right. or do you have canvases? Like, yes, I have All a of problem. All of the above. Do you have... Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've, I've got some games. I... I got the pinball bug from my dad. He enjoyed pinball and had a game or two in our basement as we were growing up. And, um, you know, I, it was another interest of mine that fell by the wayside for quite some time. I'd say probably a couple decades. I was not even thinking about pinball. And then my wife and I moved to Michigan from California in 2008. And it was right around that time I was trying to get to know my new surroundings and see what was here. There's this great arcade called Pinball Pete's. And so I, I went downstairs there, you know, down in a basement and started playing pinball. And I'm like, my gosh, this is so great. And just kept coming back and saw a flyer on the wall for a pinball expo. I'm like, what is a pinball expo? And ended up going there and spending nine hours straight pinballing my brains out. Uh, I and coming home just like this is unbelievable. I was just head over heels into this, you know, form of entertainment. And so I mentioned all this to say, getting into pinball in a big way, I really wanted to dive into it and research it and understand it better. And so I was listening to podcasts about it. Yes, there are pinball podcasts <laughs> and diving into its history and understanding, you know, the mechanics and the artwork and who made it. And to the point where I wanted to produce some of my own content. And uh, at the time, I had this real existential crisis because I had sort of formed my identity around being an autobiographical cartoonist. Like that was me. That was what I did. And when I started getting into this pinball stuff and thinking about sort of branching out, I really had a rough time, like internally coming to grips with, can I do this? Will my audience come along for the ride? Is anybody going to be interested in this? And thankfully they were, uh, you know, my co-writer Nick and I toured the book, uh, over the course of 2019, shortly before the world shut down. And, you know, we went around to about, uh, I think it was 16 stops in 10 different states. Uh, you know, it was like the best promotion two working dads could do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we sold out of our initial print run of a thousand copies and ended up reprinting mid tour just so we could finish the tour. Uh, so it went really well. Uh, That's incredible. I've, uh, I haven't played a pinball machine in years. It's oh. it really is like it's it's not a game, it's a ride. Like it really <laughs> I, I remember spending so much time on them uh, when I was when I was quite young. And um it really it, it's wonderful. I can appreciate how you would like w did you really feel an affinity for some over the other? And was it the artwork that was pulling you in in addition to obviously the sights and the sounds and 
Yes, it's it's such a it's such a rich hobby. I mean, yes, as an artist, I'm drawn to the artwork, of course, uh, but then there's the history of it. You know, I'm interested in history, and the pinball and coin op industry has such an interesting history to it. Um, you know, we interviewed essentially the Michael Jordan of pinball, Wayne Nyans. He's designed more pinball machines than anybody else on the planet. And when we interviewed him, he was 99 years old and sharp as a tack. If I'm half as sharp as him, when I'm half his age, <laughs> I'll be thankful. Um, but anyway, we, we recently lost Wayne Nyans at the ripe old age of 104 years old. And uh, But I'm so thankful for having been able to have a relationship with him. It wasn't just like a one-time interview and then we transcribe it and put it out. I was contacting Wayne probably about every couple weeks or so. And I'd get to a point in the book where I wanted to illustrate something and make it really authentic. And so I'd have questions for him and he'd be happy to chat. And his mind was just unbelievable. I'd ask him a question and he'd know instantly uh, the answer to my question. In fact, we even managed to save an important building in coin-op history from being lost forever. So the story of him leaving Western Equipment and Supply Company and moving to Gottlieb, which is a, a, a prominent manufacturer uh, at the time, uh, Gottlieb at that point shared a factory building with Chicago Coin. And I came time in the story to illustrate this. And I said, hey, Wayne, do you uh, have any documentation of this I could see? And he's like, no, I'm sorry. That I, I don't have any photographs or anything. You know, I've got my pay stubs from back then, but I don't have anything else. And so uh, I started looking around the internet. I couldn't find anything. I started seeking out pinball historians. Nobody had anything. Uh, to make a long story short, I ran into dead ends over and over and over, but I wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Uh, because I asked Wayne, I said, hey, you've got a great memory. Do you remember what this building looks like? And he said, oh, yeah, definitely. And I said, would you be willing to describe it to me, and then I'll illustrate it and email you that illustration, and you can tell me, yes, it's like this, or no, it's higher, or it's shaped differently. And that's exactly what we did. And so over the mm -hmm. course of a couple of months, you know, I would call him, and he's 99 years old, so he got tired quicker than I did. And so you're like, okay, that's enough critiques for the day. I was okay, I'll chat with you in two weeks. So uh, we'd have these phone call conversations and I'd send these iterative building illustrations to him to the point where he said, yes, that's it. And so in Coin-Op Carnival, we have three different renditions of that Chicago Coin Gottlieb shared factory building that otherwise without Wayne would have been lost to time. So I'm so thankful for the, the friendship and camaraderie that I was able to have with Wayne over the course of making that publication. That's an incredible story. And it's, it just shows you, I think, how important uh, illustrating drawing is um, in kind of supporting our humanity supporting history. Um, I, I just think that's wonderful. I'm, I'm going to have to check out this book. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. And so you've done uh, you've you've done other books. Uh, you've also done watch designs. That's true. Also, <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's a bit of a disparate interest, but um, when the pandemic hit, I think that we were all trying to figure out our own best way to make it through. And uh, at the time, I got interested in watch collecting, got interested in horology. And that sounds weird, but I think there's some ties here. Like there's artistry in watch design, there's mechanics in watch design, and it sort of parallels my interest in pinball too. Um, so it was like researching a new hobby. It got me distracted from all the things that were going on in 2020. And over the course of researching different manufacturers, I found this one in particular, Mr. Jones watches from London who created these like artist designed watches. 
and uh, was very interested in what they did and kept returning to their website and combing their archives. And eventually I just said, forget it. I'm going to email them and just introduce myself. And I did. And I said, hi, my name's Ryan. I'm a cartoonist, university professor. I love what you do. And uh, here's some of my work. If you ever have a need for additional artists, I'd love to work with you. And that was it. And then in about 24 hours or so, I heard back from the company owner and said, took a look at your portfolio, love what you do, let's talk. And so that was the start of my first watch design with Mr. Jones Watches. Uh, that watch design was a uh, an old carnival theme. And if we're able to um, share a screen again, maybe I can show your video listeners and describe it to your podcast listeners. <laughs> <laughs> and I will link to it in the show notes. Okay, great. Um, so this will be uh, part of my upcoming book, One Bite at a Time. And you can see that there's uh, sort of a carnival scene here and a shooting gallery. And these targets, these little ducks, have numbers on them, as do the targets below. So the ducks running across the top are the hours, and the targets running below are the minutes. And uh, in the book, you can actually see the various iterations that I went through in order to create this watch. So my initial plan, uh, my initial sketch was this, which I did not show to anybody, not even Mr. Jones watches, because I thought if I send them this, they're not even gonna understand what this is. So I refined that sketch a little bit to send them something that was at least intelligible, and that's what they approved. So at that point, I then started working on the final illustrations, and there are a number of different discs here, from hours disc to the minutes disc, but there's also printing on the glass of the watch itself, and even the back dial as well. So if your listeners were counting, that's actually four discs, but there's five here. And the reason for that is we were originally thinking of isolating the figures and the stand from the curtains and the teddy bears in the background here to give it a little bit more depth but eventually we worked that out of the design over the course of production because uh, it added a little too much complexity and a little too much cost to it. We wanted this to be a really accessible item. And so essentially we melded this disc and this disc together. So all of that is on the glass and then the hours and the minutes and the dial, the back dial are all behind that. So uh, that was my first design with Mr. Jones watches and it ended up breaking all company sales records for the time in which it sold out, which was two hours uh, to sell a hundred watches. And uh, you know, that got me my second design with them too. That's incredible. What a wonderful piece of work. Uh, so I will link to this if you, uh, if you're not watching the video and uh, it's, I, I remember seeing it on your site, I think, uh, as a blog, blog post and. Uh, oh, you were doing some combing then. That was a while back. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yeah. I was, I was creeping around here for <laughs> nice. sure. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of, and, and we're going to talk about the blog a little bit later, but I wanted to kind of go back to to the to the creation or, or not back to but to the creation of comics and and how you work because we have listeners who are creatives and I was at a, a, a conference recently and one of the sessions was around doing uh, comics around your nature journal mm. and there may be people listening to us who are thinking yeah I think I would want to tell a story that has multiple panels that could work off of my art and it could be nature it could be whatever right but they want to be able to leverage their ability to create and so i wonder if you can talk about maybe at this point in time how are you doing this is it um is it analog is it digital uh, how do you approach it when we talk about tools and process sure i have a wildly convoluted process that works for me that is very hybrid it's both analog and digital um i will typically start by typing words in a word processing program, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, whatever. And um, that's typically where my comics will start. But then I will also hand sketch thumbnails of pages 
but when it's time to start paneling the pages, I'm I'm really comfortable in the Adobe suite. So I panel and letter my pages on Adobe Illustrator first so that I get all the panelization and word balloons, you know, positioned appropriately. And then I'll bring that vector artwork into another program called Clip Studio that's uh, basically an illustration program. And I will hand pencil everything inside, I, I'm sorry, digitally pencil everything inside the panels uh, in Clip Studio. The reason I do that is because when you are digitally illustrating, you have the opportunity to move things around independently of one, of one another, resize, and really get composition right within the panels. Uh, it's something that I felt reluctant to do as an artist when I was doing that in an analog way. I would spend a bunch of time penciling something and then I'd think, oh, well, I spent 10 minutes on that. I don't want to redo it another 10 minutes to move it over a half an inch, even though I know that would be better. I was lazy. Uh, so that's why I digitally pencil. But I am very comfortable hand inking. So uh, after I'm done digitally penciling, I will print out in blue line on Bristol. So um, in comics and maybe other media too, uh, we have this thing called non-photo non reproductive blue pencil. And that's a big fancy name for a light blue pencil. <laughs> it's nothing magical. You can use any light blue pencil you want. But essentially, when you ink over top of that in black, you can scan it into your computer. And to make a long story short, you can magic away the pencils without having to physically erase everything. There's some, you know, editing you can do in Photoshop afterwards to just obliterate your pencils. And then you're left with a nice, clean ink line, and that's it. So anyway, all that to say, I print out in blue line my digital pencils on a physical piece of Bristol. And in order to do that, you've got to have a, a top-fed inkjet printer because if you have not a top-fed printer, then the Bristol does not like to curl around within the printer itself. And if you have a laser jet printer, which I'm guessing folks are not going to have rather than ink jets because they're way more expensive. But uh, laser jets use toner, which is heat bonded to the page. And that gets real shiny and not great for inking on top of. But an inkjet printer spits ink onto a page. You can ink right over that, no problem. So... Um, Long story short, I've got my blue pencils on a piece of Bristol now, and I will hand ink with uh, a number of different tools. And I know you like to hear about tools, so I'll tell you about mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, awesome. I, I personally like to ink with a brush pen. Uh, you can ink with a physical brush, and there are artists who will tell you there is no substitute for inking with a real brush. Uh, I have a lifestyle as a dad and a husband and a professor and a busy person who I I, I cannot deal with cleanup. I, I loathe cleanup. I want to pop a cap and be done. When somebody in my family has an issue, I need to be able to drop it at a moment's notice. Dad, the cat threw up. Okay, here I come, you know. <laughs> um, so I use brush pens and personally, I cannot tell the difference between my work using a brush and a brush pen. I think uh, with the right brush pen and uh, when you scan it and reduce it, as cartoonists tend to do, and then print it out, it looks virtually identical. So uh, I like my brush pens. And then for fixed width stuff, uh, I know there's a lot of folks who like a particular fine liner pen. And I will leave that name out because everybody uses them, but I don't want to speak disparagingly of them. Uh, but I really enjoy an alternate um, brand of fixed width pen, which is Prismacolor. Prismacolor makes a really fantastic black fixed width pen. And the reason I say I like that better is for a couple reasons. One, because I've used the fixed with pen that everybody uses <laughs> in my early work. And I noticed after about maybe five years or so that black ink started to turn brown, like it was not very archival. And so I've since used the Prismacolor black markers and those are quite 
color fast. Uh, I have not seen any fading of those lines, and I've, you know, had them around for almost as long. You know, I've noticed the browning in about five years. I've had, you know, 10, 15 years worth of using Prismacolors, and none of them have browned on me. So those are the pens that I use. And after I'm done inking, I'll scan that back into the computer where I'll threshold out the pencils and digitally color in Photoshop. So there's the long-winded process <laughs> that I go through for creating a page of comics. So can I ask you two things? One is, is the ink permanent ink? Yes, it's uh, archival ink. It's not India okay. ink, but it's archival ink. Okay. And the other question is, as someone who hasn't done a comic yet, <laughs> I have to say that anytime I speak to a creator, it's like, I'm not doing the thing yet, but who knows? <laughs> um so when would you use the fixed width over the brush? That's a fine question. So um, a brush pen is typically used to give a variable line width. And usually you use that for inking animate objects like humans or animals or sometimes plants if you want it to feel more lifelike. And you can think about inking in a number of ways, uh, like when do you ink thin? When do you ink thick? And uh, typically where the light source is hitting most, that's where you're gonna ink thin. And where there is a shadowed portion on the character, that's where you ink thick. Um, there's a number of different ways to conceptualize inking. That's just one of them. You can also think about contour lines. So thick for the exterior lines of the characters and then thin for the interior details and backgrounds. Um, and again, I don't need to give you an entire inking lesson here, but those are just a few things to think about if you're uh, planning to ink your comics. So to answer your question, the brush pen is used on typically exterior lines, contour lines of figures, whereas the fixed width pens, fine liners, are used for things like environmental details, buildings, sometimes really fine lines within characters, but not the outlines. Interesting. I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit because I, I you know, I've I've done some ink work and I've used the brush print, brush pens um, and fountain pens. Have you ever used fountain pens? I have very occasionally, but again, I told you about my propensity against <laughs> cleanup. <laughs> I, right. I find them to be uh, confusing, and then I feel silly, like you have to put a cartridge in and like ink gets all over and I, I don't know what I'm doing and I just want to have a disposable brush pen that lasts me for you know many pages and then I can go grab a new one right good enough um, but now I'm thinking so back to my point about uh, doing ink work in my books is my sketchbooks is maybe I need to be more cognizant of the brush pen for animate objects versus you know, so using some like a, like a micron pen, which I use for sketching mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, I remember when I was because I went to engineering um, school, and when we did our um, drawings, um, and you know, I, I did a, too many drawings, too much work. Oh my, it was <laughs> so much. I had a job for a summer doing uh, designing uh, the HVAC systems, so heating, mm. ventilation, and air conditioning yeah. systems, and yeah. doing those drawings was just oh my gosh, that was so hard. Um, but I don't remember the pens we were using, but, you know, you had them hold them almost completely 90 degrees uh -huh. to the paper. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you had rulers that had a lift on them so that they wouldn't drag your ink across the paper. Yep. And uh, you mess up and, oh, no, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a bit of flashback now yeah. <laughs> about working with ink because that was really challenging. Totally. Um, I hear you. I, yeah. I took a number of drafting courses and thought I was going to be an architect at one point in, you know, high school age. Um, I, I'm so thankful that my parents sent me to a summer architect intensive course. And I found out very quickly that that was not something I was interested in. <laughs> I thought from taking these classes in high school and getting good grades, I'm like, ah, oh, I could probably do that. But it was just not where my interests lied. So uh, anyway, all that to say, I know about these, uh, you know, risen rulers to avoid the ink seeping from underneath. We use that in comics too. Um, yeah, yeah, you're, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Do you ever... 
So you have this process, and as you say, your your professor, your dad, um, like you have a lot of things, and you've got to be available and agile. Do you ever just sit and sketch? Do you still have a chance to do that? I am not a big sketcher. Um, I and it's taken me a while to come to terms with that because uh, I know it's like the thing to do as an artist. You got to have a sketchbook, and um, when I have scant time available to me to create art. I want to create something that is going to result in a product, I guess. You know, I want it to work toward a book or I want it to work toward a project of some sort Um, because I have have so many rolling around in my head. There's so many things I want to do that it almost feels like uh, like I feel a little guilty if I'm just sitting around and, you know, doodling in a sketchbook and what is this going to be used for? I don't know. And I, I hear these words coming out of my mouth and I understand that that's weird. <laughs> like it, you need a place to explore, but, uh, it's just not how I function these days. Maybe, maybe when I retire, I'll feel like I have some more time, but I don't know, probably even then I'll feel like I have projects I want to get to. But um, I I will say that my relationship with sketchbooks has changed over the course of time. Um, I used to get these really um, nice looking sketchbooks and feel very intimidated by them. Like, oh gosh, they are... uh, too nice for just my my little sketches and me trying to figure things out and little notes and stuff, and I wouldn't use them. And uh, I I heard on a recent podcast, I think it was you talking about um, buying three sketchbooks. Was that on a recent show of yours? Where essentially you have like, uh, if it's too nice for you, buy three of them because then you'll start using one knowing that you have others in the wings and then it's not quite so precious. Uh, perhaps I'm getting my podcast mixed up from reading your expression, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not yet. Yeah, th- th- that's fine. It sounds like good advice. I'm not sure if I gave it. <laughs> okay. Regardless, uh, yeah. I, I, I only heard that recently. And the thing that I started using were these little just throwaway sketchbooks. They're, I don't know, maybe 48 pages or so uh, saddle stitched, and I can stuff these in my pocket or my backpack and uh, take them with me. And they're just very, they're very unprecious, Uh, you know, just a a flimsy paper cover. Uh, And I think because they are not precious that I feel more apt to draw in those. So what I will draw in sketchbooks are my thumbnail illustrations, thumbnails for my pages, thumbnails for my design projects like watches and neon signs and things like that. So uh, so now I have like a one-stop shop for any of my thumbnail sketches rather than what I was doing in the past prior to this project I mentioned to you, the uh, 20 year art book, one bite at a time, um, I would literally just grab any piece of scratch paper and, you know, scratch away on it because it was meaningless. I I thought nobody's ever gonna wanna see these things. I don't care if I see them again or not. And so many of them just ended up in my trash bin because they were worthless. They weren't the final product. The final product was what I was shooting for. But now, archiving a lot of this work, I'm thinking to myself, man, I wish I would have kept better records in terms of beginning stages of work. So um, thankfully, I have found in a number of very old sketchbooks and pulling out old drawers and finding scraps of paper, uh, some archival stuff of my projects. But now I actually have a reasonable way to uh, compile all of those in these sketchbooks so that if I'm working on a project like this in the future, I will not have the same sort of treasure hunt that it took to go through (laughs) to find all that process work. Yeah, it's good having, uh, like I I have my etcher sketchbooks, which I use most often because I just love the hot press paper Mm -hmm. and I, I use a moleskin for my graphite work. And then I do have this little tiny moleskin, similar kind of idea that is my kind of sacrificial piece. If I've got a pencil and I've got five minutes, um, you know, I can sit down and, 
you know, sketch a rock and a duck, right? Nice. Like it's, <laughs> it's, and it, it is helpful to be able to do that. But I'm wondering for you, like you talked about this idea when you, about your process where you're writing, you're putting words into a Word document, a Google Doc, whatever the case, and that kind of forms the basis, the foundation on which you build. Is that the way you brainstorm? Is that how every idea starts for you? Is it, is it that way? Like if you have, oh, I've got to, I want to do this thing. Um, is that how you're starting it? Regardless as to like, you know, trying to separate the brainstorming from, I'm going to try this idea. Like, is it always the same? The words? Um, that's a good question. Um, Cause there's like different, levels of ideation there's like a macro version where you're focusing on a page and how to solve that puzzle and how are the panels going to fit on the page into the grid structure of this page but then you have like a more macro puzzle solving of like i want to create this book what is this going to be about and i think that now that you force me to think about it that i do start with words in each instance which again is weird for an artist like i i teach comics and mostly i get art students in my classes although there are other majors too but you know they're we're all very visually minded people and i when i give my script lecture i talk about well do we start with images or do we start with words you know is it the chicken or the egg which comes first um and it's different for different people, but I think for most artists, they start by thumbnailing. Uh, at least most students that I've taught start with thumbnailing, and that's perfectly fine. There's a million different ways to make comics. It's just finding the way that works best for you. But um, for me, I think that I've been typing so long that that's faster for me than it is to sketch something out or to hand write something out that I just want to get my ideas out as quickly as possible. And for me, uh, I can type pretty darn fast. So I, I think that's my comfort level with it. I, I really like that you brought this up because, uh, you know, I've talked in the past about people when they've done their painting, their drawing, that they don't have to do a podcast, but if they can record an audio clip about the piece, what it means to them, what it's based on, telling the story, right? Because we may look and we may, I, I, when I did the presentation at this conference, I talked about that, you know, uh, there's this drawing I did of two monarch butterflies. And you may think, oh, that's, you know, a nice piece of work with two monarch butterflies. But, you know, we raised those. Mm -hmm. My daughter took the picture. They were male and female. I call it first date, but they're probably brother and sister. And uh, I'll probably put up a, cl a, a still of it here in the video, but it's it uh, having that story behind it gives it more meaning. So to have recording that audio clip, even if you share it with no one, provides a little bit of context and reflection on what you've done. And now you have me thinking that maybe one of the next pieces I do, I should write about it first mm. before I put a pencil or a pen or anything to paper. And I wonder what that does to the experience yeah i'd be right. interested to hear your thoughts about that after you do it because i would imagine and please correct me if i'm wrong do you start with imagery and sketches most of the time mm -hmm. yeah i've never i've never started with words because i'm working off either uh, you know I, I will do some stuff plein air but i'll work on a, off a reference or some kind of orchestrated reference i've done in photoshop where i'm taking a bunch of images together um, and I, I have the story in my head that I'm trying to tell, but I haven't, like my theme one year was storytelling and I'm kind of, I've wandered away from that. And I want to go back to it. And I think just writing those words down may be good. And that's where nature journaling is really helpful mm -hmm. at this conference. The nature journaling conference is it's, it's, you know, one of the comments is if you're not really happy with your artwork then put some words down on the page because <laughs> it looks more professional, right? Um, but being able to tell that story about even if you're just trying to capture a moment, uh, you know, is, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it windy? What smells in the air? That kind of thing. Um, 
but I, I'm going to have to try that. Yeah, you know, most of the work I've seen of yours is more like observational drawing, and I would be really interested to hear how writing about it first affects that. You know, most of what I do is pretty narrative driven. It's comics, it's paneled, it's sequential, it's time based. Whereas uh, the work that I've seen from you is more like capturing a moment, capturing a snapshot. And man, I'd, I'd love to see how that writing process affects your work. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to try that because it's. Uh... Uh, like I know the story, right? The snapping turtle I did recently. I I, I know what happened before and after that, mm. but no one else does. Right. I should have maybe started writing that down yeah. and then worked from there and see what that see what happens next, right? Yeah. Let me let um, me know how because... that uh, how that affects your <laughs> your process. Great, I've given myself homework <laughs> <laughs> without asking you for it. <laughs> so let's get back to this book because um, you know the the Kickstarter page. Uh, you gave me kind of an early look, and I, I commented that the video was incredible, which is really what you need to have. Um, and I think it's it can be daunting for people to create a Kickstarter Kickstarter campaign around a piece of work they want to do. Uh, is is some is kickstarting a project something that everyone can do? Uh, you know, I've heard. Jake Parker and other people talk about it, and you know, you really need a fan base to do that is that is that true can do you think even if you have a few hundred people you could still maybe do something definitely so all of that is true it's called crowdfunding because you need to bring a crowd and if you don't have a crowd then there's probably not going to be any funding in your future <laughs> so um this is something that I coach my students through over the course of a semester in my advanced comics class. Um, so I offer them the option of being coached through a Kickstarter campaign. And one of the most important things I have them do is to start collecting email addresses. And our goal is 100 email addresses by the time they push that launch button. And they think, oh gosh, 100 emails, I could never. And I said, well, let's think about this for a minute. And I have this all outlined in a week by week uh, you know, outline for them. And essentially it's 10 email addresses a week over the course of 10 weeks. That's two email ad addresses a day. And I tell them, start with me. I'll give you my email address. That's one. Now you only have one more to go today. And then get a couple more tomorrow. Okay, well, who am I going to get? Well, mom, dad, okay, there's your next day. Uh, friends, there's the rest of the week. Teachers, maybe you can get another couple days the following week. And then I say, do you have social media? Yes, inevitably they do. Uh, how many friends, followers, et cetera, do you have? Oh, I don't know, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000, however many they have. I said, okay, we'll go through that list and start writing people individually, direct message them and say, hi, uh, I'm glad we're friends on here. Uh, I just want to let you know about this exciting new project I'm working on. It's a comic about blah. And if you would like to keep up with that, I'm sending out an email every month or so updating people on the work that I'm doing on it. This is sort of behind the scenes stuff before it comes out. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, let me know. And that's it. And then they gather those emails over the course of, you know, 10 weeks or so, and they get pretty darn close to 100 emails. And every single person that's done that has launched their campaign and had success. Uh, so we really talk about a lot of the intricacies as we go through, but that's a big one, that you need to bring people to this party. You don't just launch a page and then the party happens. Like You've got to have the guest list and bring it there. Yeah, I noticed that um, a lot of artists do it really well in the sense that they build up that momentum through social media. So it almost becomes that the Kickstarter campaign becomes a summary event of what they've been doing for the last year. Yes. In the teasers and, and you know, there, here's this image and here's this. And, and it becomes obvious at the end when they launch the Kickstarter. It's like, ah, you were working on a book or you were working <laughs> on this or whatever, right? Um, that's It's really clever. And I, I'm glad you talked about the email list because I think people – look at things like Instagram and we've I've talked about this on the podcast before as their portfolio and it's it really shouldn't be it should be a funnel um it's it's not an output and uh that 
the email list is your most important tool to be able to connect with your with your fans. Amen. Yes. And your supporters. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. When when folks ask me about, you know, what's the best thing a beginning artist can do in their career, start an email list. And luckily I was told that very early in my career. And thinking back to twenty something Ryan, uh, when that person told that to me, I was a little standoffish at first. I said, Oh, I don't know, that seems really salesy. I don't I don't wanna ask people for their email addresses. And th- the person said, No, no, you're going to a convention already to sell your work. Just put out a piece of paper, write email list on it, and you don't even have, you don't have to say anything. Just let people sign up if they want to. I'm like, oh, I guess that's passive enough where I'm willing to do that. So I put it out and sure enough, people started signing up and I've been collecting email addresses for, you know, almost 20 years at this point. And that is my lifeline as an artist. Yes, I have social media. Yes, I promote on there, but the email list is your direct communication with your people, your audience, your folks who want to know what you're doing. So, um, I would say start an email list and maintain it. Figure out a frequency that works for you. There are people who update weekly, and I cannot imagine doing that. (laughs) I don't have enough output to update weekly. I think they would just be really boring updates if I did that. Some people are prolific enough where they can do that. I am not one of them. So uh, for a very long time, I was doing quarterly updates. Over the course of the pandemic, I really started feeling this pull for greater connection with people in my life and my audience too. And so I sent out a poll to my email list and said, hey, my here's my thoughts. I'd like to communicate with you more. Would that be okay with you? Because basically for the past umpteen years, I said, hey, I'm going to contact you quarterly and I don't want to break that trust without talking to you first. So, you know, almost unanimously, the folks who responded to that said, yes, we'd love to hear from you more. So now I'm sending it out every other month or so. And, um, you know, in a little more frequent contact with my readers than I was before. Yeah. So anyway, all that to say, develop a frequency that works for you. Don't think that you have to do it weekly just because somebody else is. Right. Yeah. I've struggled with that, uh, you know, where I was trying to do it. I, I, so I used to, I, I had an, I, I had an easing like 20 years ago and, uh, uh, the domain was actually called brain paint. I mm-hmm. thought it was a wonderful domain. I should have kept it, but I actually sold it for quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And I had an e-zine where I was, it was an internet coaching magazine is what I called it. So I taught people how to do GIF animations or GIF animations, depending <laughs> on what, what, what side of that you fall on. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, this was a long time ago, but, uh, I tried to create a bit of a format around my newsletter and I realized I don't have to do that. Like it doesn't have to be um, everything. That doesn't have to be a section that needs content. It's not a newspaper. And so what I think what I'm embracing now is the idea that I'll release it two or three days after each podcast. So every two weeks. And that way I can reinforce the podcast and talk about what's happening, the books um, that, that I'm reading and things like the courses that are coming out as well, and there's some reinforcement there. So, it's um, it is finding that frequency that works for you. Luckily, I have a podcast, which is a lot of work, but it also means it's content for something like that. Um, so that, now, in addition to that, you uh, you have a Patreon as well. I do. Yes. So, and I'm sorry. Go how's ahead. How's that working? Uh, that's working super well for me, actually. Uh, it's had really slow and steady growth for me over the past. Gosh, I've been doing it for about a year and a half, or maybe going on two almost at this point. Going on two years, actually. Um, and that's been a really fantastic outlet for me. For a very long time, I was blogging on my website, elephanteater.com, and I still do. I still update that website, but it's not quite as frequently. I used to update weekly, and uh, now I probably update more like monthly. And But my Patreon, I update a couple times a week. 
And so they're getting weekly updates of what's happening with this project and behind the scenes photos of what I'm doing. And um, so that's been really fun to keep up with. And there's typically a really nice dialogue in the comments section. Uh, it's just been really uh, a positive thing for me, I know, and I hope a positive thing for my my patrons too. Uh, and like I said, there's been a steady increase in um, uh, patronship. Uh, is, is that a word? <laughs> patronship. Sure. So, <laughs> so it's been really great. Um, I I really enjoy sharing what I'm doing, and also sharing some thoughts and inspiration, things that are inspiring me. Uh, be that books or videos or comics or going on a walk or a bike or what have you. Um, it's just been a really positive experience all around and one that's seen nice, steady growth as well. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm still struggling with Patreon, but I'll, I'll figure it out. It's it's tough because, you know, you think about your outputs, right? Like you, you're posting this and that on Patreon. So what goes into the newsletter? Are you repurposing some of that? Um, that becomes a little bit challenging. Yeah. Uh, for me, I've started thinking about Patreon as immediately updated content. So they get weekly updates from me on Fridays. And then I also include like a whatever Tuesday. And Tuesday could be like, I recorded a podcast. I do a Patreon podcast with different creators. Or I... Uh, critiqued some students work and here's something that came up a lot in the critiques so if you're a cartoonist too maybe here's something that could work for you or just any number of things that don't quite fit into that friday update so i'm updating two times a week on patreon and i think that um developing a frequency for yourself on patreon that's manageable just like an email list is really important so i can say hey updating two times a week with over 200 posts uh, that you can explore. You know, that helps people jump on and then help them stay on when that content keeps coming. And so if Patreon is my like immediate what's happening right now, when I send out my emails to my larger list every other month, I'll typically go back and comb my Patreon for the past couple months and see like what were some of the highlights, what was really interesting in here and pull a couple of those and then post it in my my email updates so like one's kind of feeding the other and keeping the entire ecosystem running that's awesome i think that's that's helpful advice for people uh you know repurposing content and thinking about frequency and and channels something i still have to work on but i uh, appreciate your your thoughts on that. yeah yeah if if you don't mind me talking just one yeah. little bit more about Patreon, I used to sure I used to think of it as like, okay, I have to create Patreon exclusive content. Like people are paying me for this, and it would be rude of me to show that somewhere else. Those were my thoughts as a creator, as a consumer, as a patron of other folks. If they did that, if I saw it somewhere else, I wouldn't care. But for some reason, I had that hang up as a creator. And so I put out a poll on my Patreon and said, what do you guys think about this? Would you be upset if content came out a month after I post it here, a week after I post it here, a day immediately? And like unanimously, they said, we wouldn't care if you put it out on the same day. We just want to be here to support you. We love what you're doing. We love it coming into our inbox every day, and then we don't have to go search for it. So that was really freeing for me as a content creator. Like, oh, okay, I can repurpose this stuff. And I still don't post things the same day, but uh, I, I will reuse it in newsletters, and then I will eventually reuse some of it in social media posts. So uh, that's really made my inner monologue a whole lot easier <laughs> with that knowledge that, that that's helpful because i think uh yeah it's it is that struggle about what's exclusive and exclusive just could be timely like yeah 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 so let's talk about the book a little bit more because uh, I want to ask a couple of things about this, and, and, and that is, why are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. That's a question my wife asked me when I told her the idea five years ago. 
<laughs> so this this all started uh, in 2019. I told you my buddy and I were touring Coin Op Carnival, and we were very busy promoting this book that entire year. And at the end of the year, we got to the end of the tour. I was literally sitting at the last tour stop at the end of the year, and I came to the realization, oh my gosh, this is my 15th anniversary of making comics, and I didn't do anything about it. <laughs> so at that point, I vowed, okay, for my 20th anniversary, my next you know round number, I'm going to make a big deal of it in some way, shape, or form. And I came up with the idea to do an art book that featured 20 years of my work. And I, you know, was out to dinner with my wife and I pitched her this idea and, you know, hey, what do you think? And <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, my wife is not only very smart, but also uh, very direct. And she looked at me and said, I don't get it. Like, why are you doing this? And <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a celebration of 20 years, right? And like, uh, I don't know. Like, I think it needs something more. Like, why are you doing this? And so that really forced me to sit down and think about the purpose for this book. So I've really developed this book around the overarching theme of process for a couple of different reasons. One, I love process work. I love seeing how people do what they do, whether it's artwork or making uh, parachutes or who knows what they're doing. I love seeing how people do what they do. And so that was a connection for me. But I think that also fed into this sort of extension of Ryan Clater, the educator. So I'm a university educator. I teach people how to do art, how to make comics. And uh, over the course of this book, you're going to see how I make comics, watches, neon designs, uh, fancy pancakes, all sorts of different stuff. And uh, with this heavy emphasis on process, I think it's going to be kind of an educational tool as well. And then finally, at the same time, I listed a bunch of those production extras. I really love books as art. I like it when people pay attention to the packaging beyond just, okay, the interior's done, send it to the printer, let's get it off already. Uh, like I like it when people will take time and think about how the format can speak to the content of the work. So I mentioned how some of those formatting items really bolster this theme of process that runs throughout. I showed you that page with the die cut holes in it. Another mm -hmm. specialty formatting option I'm including is a uh, vellum overlay for one of my drawings in here. And just to pull back the curtain a little bit, I have a really hard time as an artist illustrating interlocking items. Like when things start, you know, being layered and uh, like if someone were to give someone a hug or like those arms moving around different pieces break my brain a little bit. I can do it, but it's really hard for me. Uh, likewise, I draw pinball machines and those are ridiculously layered items. So the only way I was able to conceptualize of how to physically draw this one particular play field I was drawing that had a bunch of ramps and stuff on top of it was to draw everything on the play field first and then take a piece of tracing paper and overlay it on my piece of Bristol and illustrate all the ramps on top of that. That also allowed me to scan them separately and color them a lot easier. So that was my working method for that drawing. But when I reproduce it in this book, I'm including a sheet of vellum that's going to overlay that reproduced original artwork so that you can see as close to the original process work as possible, this is how it was created. So again, these specialty formatting items are just going to, uh, I hope, really reinforce that theme of process that runs throughout the book. It's fantastic. Uh, who Who is this book for? <laughs> um, I think this book is for a number of folks. I think it is for artists. I think artists will be interested in how the heck is a custom neon sign made? How do you make a page of comics? How do you make a watch? Well, I'm going to show you and pull back that curtain and give you a bunch of images for how these things are created. 
I think it's also for the art curious. Like, I don't know. I'm sort of thinking about art. What does it take to do? Um, so I think maybe some of my students would be interested in it. I think longtime artists would be interested in it. And my hope is that it reaches an audience beyond that so that it can educate people who are not artists that these pieces don't just come to be. There's a process that goes into this. Uh, I've read a lot of art books and a good number of them are just pretty picture after pretty picture. And um, while they're, the art itself is impressive, I'm left feeling a little empty in those experiences because I have so many questions about them when I'm done. Like, uh, when was this made? Who was it made for? Why did you make it? And I'm trying to contextualize each piece in the book with a little narrative. You'll see that there's maybe a paragraph or two paired with a bunch of process images and then finally a big showcase image on the recto or right hand side of the page. So um, that's my hope is that it reaches new artists, existing artists, and maybe art curious folks. Interesting. And one thing I read in there, was I wrong in seeing this? I mentioned about uh, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, yeah. Um, I grew up watching Mr. Rogers, uh, fed my son multiple episodes of Mr. Rogers, and I still love Mr. Rogers to this day. Um, he's an incredible human being, uh, somebody to model oneself after, right? But one of the yep. things that really stuck with me from my childhood were those factory tours that he did. And I still love going to factory tours, even as an adult. You know, my 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 mom would come to visit me in Michigan here and I'd take her to the uh, the Jiffy factory tour. You know, they make uh, like cornbread um, mixes and brownie mixes and stuff like that. Um, took her to a teddy bear factory tour and we still love going on these factory tours. So yes, you're right. Mr. Rogers was uh, like the earliest form of process reveal that I can remember. And I still love uh, understanding what people do today. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so t two comments on that. If, if you ever come to Ottawa, you have to go to the Canadian Mint huh. because they have a tour in how they make their exquisite coins, so they're you know their custom coins. I had Anna Bucciarelli on here, uh, who's a wonderful artist, and so she she's done a bunch of coins for them. Oh wow! And uh, it's it's wonderful. They tell you the story about uh, the different types of coins, and you know when there's probably going to be a story now about King Charles and how that coin was developed and which way he faces mm -hmm. and why mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's a wonderful small tour of the Canadian Mint, and it's incredible. But just back to Mr. Rogers when I saw that like I have a very soft spot for Mr. Rogers and um, I think about it every time I speak and I, and I speak to others and I do the podcast I had someone say that um, that uh, I was a mix between Mr. Rogers and Bob Ross and I thought <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty great description actually <laughs> that is. having listened to you that's that's spot on <laughs> 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 Thank you. I, I just when somebody said that, I, I was seriously in tears, and I showed my wife, and it was like, I think I, I'm I'm done. I think this is this is it. Hard to get higher praise um, than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I didn't even think of putting that together, and I'm just I was so pleased to to, to read that. But um, I just wanted to mention because uh, there is a documentary coming out. I don't know if you ever saw Mr. Dress Up, mm -hmm. uh, which was a Canadian huh. show. And so Ernie Coombs and uh, Fred Rogers were together. I think Fred Rogers started in Canada together. And so they were good friends. And if you enjoyed Mr. Rogers, uh, you would enjoy Mr. Dress Up. And mm. I used to watch Mr. Dress Up all the time because it was a similar situation. He had... Um, uh, he he had like a tickle trunk where he had his costumes and uh, he had uh, there was various puppets in the show mm. but the thing that struck me struck me with him was that he would draw he would tell stories by drawing oh interesting and uh, so he had an easel and he would talk about going to the grocery store and he would draw a grocery bag and this and, and they would flip the page and continue telling the story to Casey and Finnegan were the two uh, puppets uh, and 
that's I I want it to be that uh-huh. I want to be the person who tells stories by drawing and uh, uh, there's a documentary that I think it's on Amazon I I don't know if it'll be in the available in the U.S. I would hope so but uh, it's it's dear to my heart to see him because he I guess he was exactly the same kind of person wow. in person wow. yes and uh, uh, it's amazing the impact that these shows have on us years and years and years later yeah so it was i was so happy to see mr rogers it's like yes. <laughs> yeah i'm gonna have to look up mr dress up now i've i've not heard of him and that's really interesting to hear some of the parallels with like the puppets and uh yeah very cool mr rogers never drew though that i know of um, yep so yeah that's a really interesting additional component that he had i'm gonna have to look this up yeah, it, Mr. Dressup was uh, like, he, he would always reach in and he'd pull like a pirate's costume or a <laughs> dinosaur and he'd tell a story around it. And there was a, a tree in his backyard and that's where Casey and Finnegan uh, lived. Mm-hmm. And you were never quite sure um, if, if Casey was uh, a boy or a girl or like it was it was always like it was way ahead of its mm-hmm. time, right? Where you weren't caught up in, in things like yeah. that. And it was... Um, I just, I really loved the show. I mean, you know, there was the Friendly Giant and stuff like that, but I really liked Mr. Dress because he would draw every episode. Mm. He would draw something. So cool. And, uh, yeah, I really love that. Right. I'll be so, looking this uh, up. You have to check it out. And looking in your show notes, too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I think he did, like, I, I'm going to say for a thousand episodes. Wow. Like, it was a ridiculous amount of, of, of shows oh, that he that's did. that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah, so I will drop a bunch of this. I'm sure that you can find it on YouTube now, all the shows. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah Mr. I'm tempted to search right now, but I don't want to clack during the, the interview. <laughs> all you have to do is check the show. Right. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we're going to get to homework. I, I could probably talk with you for another couple hours, <laughs> but uh, we'll get to homework. But I wanted to... Uh, also ask you a question and I just I, I don't ask every guest this question but I have to ask you this question if you had a chance to have lunch with a fictional or non-fictional person dead or alive who would it be um so I am in a very fortunate position to work at a university where I direct a comics event and I've been able to invite a lot of my heroes to campus and take them out to dinner take them out to lunch so I've been able to have a private dinner with Sergio Aragones I've been able to become friendly with Emil Ferris and Seth and you know these like Mount Rushmore's of mine right uh, but if it were anyone uh, I think it's got to be Mr. Rogers. Uh, how incredible would that be to sit down and have a conversation with someone like that? I mean, you you mentioned stories of Mr. Dress Up and Mr. Rogers. I've heard times where uh, I haven't seen this, but I need to look this up. That Mr. Rogers was on. Um, oh gosh, what was that television program where they? like play a prank on someone and they're filming it and then they say, oh you're you're on candid camera i think maybe that's what it was yeah. um and i guess mr rogers was was pranked at some point and it was something that would have got somebody flustered and riled up i can't remember what they did to him but he was just responded in the same way that he would on the television show it was like Oh, that's okay. You know, don't worry. We all make mistakes. It's like, oh my God, this, like, <laughs> what an incredible person. So I would yeah. love to sit down with someone like that and just have a relaxing lunch. <laughs> I uh, cheers. I, I would do. I would do the same thing. I, I, yeah. I didn't really think about that. That would be fantastic. And I'm sure that you've seen and others have, have heard and seen his. Uh, was it when he spoke to Congress? Yes. Um, I'll link to that. That's on YouTube, and that's a worthy yes, watch as for well, sure. just to see the, the real person behind yes. it. Yes. Whoever's yeah. listening right now, please go click that link in the show notes right now. It's so worth it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think we need more of conversations like that in this day and age with everything that's going yeah. on. So, uh, yeah. yeah. 
So I, I, I do like to explore this idea of, of homework, and I feel like I, I, I brought some on myself uh, in writing a <laughs> story before I do my next, my next study or my next painting or drawing. Um, but Ryan, I'm wondering if you can put together a, a little bit of a, a task, a little bit of homework for the listener who wants to, to walk away with uh, something to do. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a comics artist. I like comics. I like narrative in my artwork. And... I would like to challenge your listener to make a comic, but that's a very tall order. So I want to pare it way down. I want you, dear listener, (laughs) to make a three panel comic strip about your day. What was the beginning? What's something notable in the middle? How did it end? There's your comic. So remember that you can use words or you don't have to. It's totally up to you. Put some images, maybe some words, in three boxes. See if you can string a narrative together. That's it. Wow. So similar to like a, a, a peanuts or something like that, just a cereal one after the other kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Weekly peanuts was typically around four panels or so. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to pare it down even further like uh, yeah. enough for you to string together something with a beginning middle and end but it's gonna be real efficient <laughs> so if they do this uh can they t- and they decide to share it i'm thinking instagram is probably the best place for it can they tag you oh sure that'd be great um okay. my instagram handle is coin op carnival and you can find me there on instagram um yep I'd be happy to see it okay so- Okay, so if you if you do decide to do this, tag Ryan, tag me. Uh, we'll share it. We'll talk about it. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see what people awesome. do. I'm not going to com- commit myself on this <laughs> one, but I, I, I've got so much other homework to do. Um, now, before I let you go, I wanted to, you know, we've had such wonderful emails back and forth, and I really appreciate uh, you really take so much time in putting your thoughts down that if you ever have the opportunity to receive an email from Ryan, uh, it'll make your day. Uh, so just just the thought into into writing is is appreciated. I I, I feel like I, I I got a couple of emails and it's like I just I, I want to I want to I want to be good. I want to I want to make him proud. So I'm going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> I can't commit to the words today. Um, but uh, you know, I, the reason I say that is uh, one of the things that we we talked about, and you mentioned it as well, was this was that was this idea of burnout and um, dealing with that. And I'm wondering, maybe to to kind of end the show, like, ha- have you have you come across that, and, and how have you dealt with it? Because I think we all experience it. It may not be because of the things that we make, the 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 stories that we think of, the stories that we write, the, the art that we create. It may be, like me, it's associated to other things that contribute and, and end up weighing you down. And I'm wondering maybe if you can speak to that a little bit and maybe how you've maybe managed that uh, through your career as well. Yeah, of course. Well, first of all, thanks for your very kind words. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to know the email is well, well received. <laughs> um <laughs> As far as burnout, yes, of course, I have experienced that too. And I used to get really frightened about it. Uh, Earlier in my career, I would think, oh gosh, I'm not thinking of anything to make. I don't have ideas or I don't have the motivation to do it. Am I done? Like, is this it? Was that all I have? But now after having done this for 20 years, I've seen ebbs and flows within my creativity and I understand it a little better and know that I can expect it and also know that it's not permanent and that in and of itself makes me feel a whole lot better like okay I just did a real big project and I'm not hopping back on the drafting table right away and that's okay (laughs) I, I used to think man it's been like you know, it's been a month, it's been two months since I've done anything and uh, just really get down on myself about it and sort of spiral because of it. Um, and that did me no good. <laughs> but again, with the 
the hindsight of 20 years, I can see that happening multiple times. And so what I'd like to say to your audience is if you are a newer artist, uh, like maybe Mike, uh, who has been doing this, uh, you know, just somewhat recently, I, I still find that hard to believe because your work is flawless. Like I could not produce a lot of the Thank things you. that you do. And to hear that you've just sort of recently started this up just blows my mind. So anyway, for, for newer artists, I'd say if you encounter that, please take solace and know that it's not permanent. Also, give yourself some grace. We all deserve it, especially after the last three years we've all been through, three and a half years. It's just been uh, such a trying time for everyone in a myriad of different ways. So um, it's not permanent. Have grace with yourself and be okay with making very small steps towards something. Um, my self-publishing company is called Elephant Eater Comics. That's based on a saying that my dad would tell my siblings and I as we were growing up. He'd say, well, it's like eating an elephant. You just do it one bite at a time, and before you know it, you're done. <laughs> and so I try to keep that in mind as best as I can to keep myself grounded while working on larger projects like going through school or making books or a particularly ambitious art piece um, and also pay tribute to my dad too. Um, so those would probably be my, my three recommendations. One, no, it's not permanent. Two, um, uh, have some grace with yourself. And three, don't be afraid to start taking those tiny steps. If you keep taking tiny steps just a little bit each day, before you know it, you're going to have something finished. That's wonderful. That's a great note to end <laughs> on. So before I let you go, though, I want uh, you to share, if you can, uh, where people can find you on the interwebs. We kind of talked about it a little bit, but maybe you can uh, share where they can find you and where they can find your Kickstarter. Sure. As well. Yeah. So this month, I'm trying to direct everyone toward onebiteatatimebook.com. That's onebiteatatimebook.com. Dot com. That'll take you straight to the Kickstarter page. And uh, otherwise, my website is elephanteater.com, and you can find a whole bunch of my work there, too. That's awesome. Thank you, Ryan. I want to uh, remind the listener to take care of yourself, each other, and keep drawing. And, uh, Ryan, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been wonderful. I'd love to have you back in the future. We could talk about how successful this campaign was. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that we can uh, find a few more things to talk about as well. So I just want to thank you again for your time. And uh, thank you for agreeing to do this as video as well. Of course. So, yeah. And, and uh, thank you not only for the kind words you're saying about me. Thank you. But also for your body of work, not just your art, but this podcast, I've listened to it a whole bunch. And I know that a bunch of other people have too, as was evidenced by your hundredth episode. <laughs> uh, so I, I would understand if it became too much because you do a ton of work for this, but selfishly, I hope that you continue doing this because it's really good. Uh, I hope you keep it up. So thank you. Thanks so much. That's uh, that's really kind. You're gonna make me blush. <laughs> I'll have to adjust. We, we've got it on video. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, take care, and uh, we will talk soon. And best of luck with your. Campaign. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks. <laughs>